Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Professor Richard Portis of the London Business School. Richard, thanks for joining us today. A pleasure. I remember an excellent presentation you gave at the Economics Festival at Trento a few years ago, um, discussing the perils of austerity uh, by and large and uh, the, the prevailing uh, German, Germanic-centric uh, paradigm. Um, it does seem that uh, nothing has changed, even though uh, the, the damage even appears more manifest today. The only thing that has changed is the behavior of the European Central Bank, and that, of course, was a great struggle. Uh, but it has made a big difference, as you can see, uh, not just uh, in the markets, but in expectations and in general attitudes. Uh, but aside from that, no, the uh, position on fiscal uh, austerity hasn't changed at all. Uh, Germany is moving towards running a budget surplus. Germany is also running a big current account surplus, as we know. Uh, and the Eurozone, as a whole, has been running a primary surplus on fiscal accounts for the past four years. This is crazy. And why do you think it is that this narrative continues to be so prominent in, in, in Europe? Why this policy continues to predominate, even though the economic damage has been so manifest in, in, in so many countries? I think it's partly morality. Um, it's the way in which things have been pitched, that the uh, creditors are virtuous and the debtors are not, um, and they should pay for their guilt. Uh, but of course, this is completely wrong. The creditors were equally responsible for uh, the problems of the debtor countries. And uh, as in so many cases, there's no way to make the creditors adjust. It's always the debtors that have to take the burden of adjustment, whatever the division of responsibility might be. In this case, it was the banks of the creditor countries, typically, that lent irresponsibly to, uh, uh, to uh, firms and, and banks uh, in the debtor countries. Uh, and those banks in the creditor countries have been bailed out. They've been bailed out with public money that simply has augmented the debts of countries that, um, that had to do those bailouts. And, that, and, and that's been uh, vividly demonstrated in the case of Greece in particular. Um, the, the common complaint one hears in uh, the, the northern part of Europe is that you have these profligate Greeks who've received all this money. Uh, they haven't made any way in the way of significant economic reforms. And in fact, uh, what seems to have been the case is that the bailouts have actually been uh, uh, bailouts to the banks uh, via the fig leaf of, of offering debt relief to Greece. In fact, it seems to have been recycled out of the country as quickly as it's come in again. That's absolutely correct. Um, the one bit that I would disagree with somewhat is that, no, the Greeks were profligate. They're the only case of serious fiscal profligacy before and leading up to the crisis. Uh, and that was, uh, there were major economic policy mistakes there. And some of it was hidden away, which is even perhaps worse. Uh, but um, that said, yes, exactly this phenomenon. And now the Greeks, supposedly, all these funds have been bailing out the Greeks um, and uh, uh, they've been transfers. They haven't been transfers at all. They've been loans, right? More debt for the Greeks, right? And what is happening with the new loans, any new loans that come, comes along, they're just being used to pay back the old loans. So the result of that together with the huge depression that these macroeconomic policies have brought to Greece is that the Greek ratio of debt to income, to GDP, has inexorably risen, except for some debt relief in uh, debt restructuring in spring of 2012. Uh, and, you know, that's, um, uh, but the picture is one of, indeed, the Greeks living off, uh, somehow, uh, the fat of the land, uh, subsidized by taxpayers from elsewhere. There are no subsidies. There are loans. And so far, nobody in the official sector has been willing even to think about uh, canceling any of those loans or restructuring those loans in any significant way, uh, as, for example, is so often done in the Paris Club. Is that, in fact, uh, the way we ultimately resolve this crisis? Does there have to be some form of debt restructuring? Well, of course. Absolutely. The, you know, the fiction right now is, you know the story, it's extend and pretend. That is to say, extend the maturities, 
bring down the interest rates some so that the actual current burden of debt service is somewhat lower, uh, and pretend that someday Greece is going to amortize this debt. It's not going to happen. Okay? And historically, it doesn't happen. This would, you know, you can look back, and I, I have worked a lot on sovereign debt and the history of sovereign debt over the years uh, since the Latin American crisis of the 1980s. And if you look, actually, it's very instructive what happened in the 1980s because, in the end, Latin America had a lost decade because it was under the constraints of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, being overly indebted. Uh, then along came the Brady Plan, uh, which uh, effectively forgave a significant part of the debt. And with some degree of debt forgiveness, and then the result of the, the impetus that that gave to growth, they grew out of their debt in the 1990s. And 1990s were a wonderful decade for Latin America. Right? So, you know, this is it's this obvious from historical experience, and it's obvious to anybody who's ever really looked carefully at the history of sovereign debt. Do you think uh, it's going to take a, a Brexit, uh, an, an exit of Greece from the euro, in order to uh, get this changing paradigm so that this debt restructuring does take place? That almost by necessity would force some debt restructuring because Greece presumably would go back to the drachma and there'd be a lot of debt that wouldn't be, ever get Oh, yes, absolutely. No, no. If, if Greece were to exit, uh, it would be, after all, it would be in a position not too dissimilar to that of uh, Argentina in, uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, right? Uh, and, of course, Argentina ended up with a debt default to the extent of about 75% of its obligations. Uh, now, you know, what, that, what, what, what would the, the haircut be in the Greek case? Who knows? Uh, conditions are somewhat different. The legal conditions are, unfortunately, somewhat different. Uh, and, uh, yes, how do you deal with the legal conditions? Because my understanding is that, you know, it goes to, it, it will be adjudicated in, according to British law, which does have significant implications. British law, if, if, to the extent that it's British law, is a much better, it's a much better position than if it were New York law. New York uh -huh. law now is completely bizarne. As any Argentinian uh, will tell you. As any Argentinian will tell you, but I mean, okay, they would say that, wouldn't they? But, <laughs> but people who are sort of independent like myself, uh -huh. been looking at these things and, and, and sovereign debt, uh, uh, and uh, sovereign immunities and so on, uh, and collective action clauses and pari passu, who've been looking at these things for many years, we were stunned by what the New York courts, uh, what the New York court, and that particular judge, uh, did. But it has really changed the name of the game to some extent. And uh, this is not, we believe, the case in London. Not yet, anyway. So, uh, but that, to go back to your question about Greek exit from the euro. I think it would be a tragedy for Greece. Uh, I think it would have Argentina, um, the, the effects in the short run, first few years, were quite devastating. The middle classes were wiped out. Their savings were wiped out. Now, you could say, oh, the Greek middle classes are already wiped out, you know, so, but no, it would be much worse. Uh, and um, uh, moving, Greece moving out of monetary union could ultimately lead to Greece moving out of the European Union. There are historical issues here. Uh, for In fact, Greece. there is an argument that if they left the currency, they would have to leave the Union as well. There is a supposedly legal argument on that, but I, you know, I don't think that that's, we should take that too seriously. But, but you know, there are forces in Greece that would uh, take the opportunity to, to uh, try and exit from the, from the EU, like, uh, like Mike. We're, we're ha we'll have a referendum on that in the UK. But more importantly for me, anyway, uh, perhaps I, I think the odds of that exit of Greece from the European Union are probably, well, I, I think the odds are still fairly low for the UK, but they're not trivial. Uh, I think for the, 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 the effect that would certainly be important is not so much contagion to the markets, the bond markets of uh, the other countries in the monetary union, but rather uh, the realization that this was not forever. Uh, and uh, once that taboo is broken, once it becomes accepted that a country can leave the monetary union, right, even if it has terrible consequences for the country concerned, nevertheless, um, other countries might etc. And at that point, it becomes a very hard fixed exchange rate regime. They break down. It's, it's like the ERM all over again. They break down. They break down. That's what 
uh, in a modern world of massive cross-border capital flows, you cannot maintain that. That's that's always been my view that you know the the the, uh, the currency union is, is only as strong as its weakest link, and if you let mm -hmm. Greece go, that you are uh, unleash something that's Ab absolutely absolutely. So as I say, I'm not concerned about. Uh, in, in the first instance, about what would happen uh, to Spanish bond markets or Portuguese bond markets or whatever. I'm concerned that this would be the beginning of the end of monetary union. Some people would welcome that, not me. Uh, do you think in Germany they would welcome it, or is it still the prevailing uh, there are the certain, There are, as you know, there are strong uh, are parties, not that strong, but there are parties in Germany, political parties, that are openly advocating that Germany should exit from the euro. Uh, so uh, there is a constituency for that. How broad it is, um, the polls, I don't think you can very easily trust opinion polls on this sort of issue. Uh, when, uh, if, if, if Germany were to go to a referendum on this question, uh, just as when Britain goes to a referendum on leaving the European Union, uh, people reflect on the gravity of the decision and they are not as inclined to do a risky thing as uh, as they might as they as they as they say to the pollsters so um, i think uh, i don't think you could get a majority in germany but it is striking to me to go back to the point of uh, uh, greg said that, that it's it's being treated as blithely as it is by the markets of possibility, which I would say is, is well, certainly substantially increased in the last few weeks. Uh, yes. Um, uh, the, yes. The, the, um, the notion that this it's just a small economy and it doesn't really have no, no, it's, it's, it's a bit like the argument we used to hear about Lehman Brothers. You know, it's a small right. investment yes. bank, and, and, and uh, this is you know, it, it's what it did. And the, the the analogy with Lehman is perfectly reasonable. Uh, what Lehman did was. Uh, lead to a perception that you couldn't trust any part, any counterparty, okay? And that's why the financial system froze up. Uh, and what, uh, and, and so it was, a, it was a change in perceptions. It was a change in psychology in the markets. Uh, and that, I think, is what would happen if Greece were to leave, uh, you know, that there would be a change in perceptions. That, as I say, what was once to be frozen in stone and developed internally over the years now becomes, well, if the calculus of, you know, et cetera, well, maybe we should uh, get out or, or, or whatever. And I think that would be ultimately would lead to the demise of the monetary union. So I really do feel that it's very important to keep Greece in. And I think it's important for the Greeks, too. I think it's important for Greece. I think they would be better off. But, but... Um, we have to find a better way of dealing with their problems than we have. I'm afraid that the new government is not um, delivering much on that yet, but we'll see. They've only been in for a few weeks, but it's... Uh, it's well, been uh, uh, it's, no, it's, uh, it's two and a half months now. Hmm? Um, Short of a Grexit, um, what do you think needs to be done to uh, change this um, death spiral that we've got in the, in the European Union as far as its economic prospects go? Well... Yes, I think we have to get more sense in fiscal policy. Uh, and there are some movements in this direction. Uh, there's a bit more flexibility than there was, uh, for sure. And uh, you, um, you, know, you have both France and Italy uh, lobbying for that. Now, I have a little more sympathy, in a way, with Italy than France. And France has been a, a serial offender uh, in these matters for a long time, and the irresponsibility uh, with which French politicians have treated their budgetary fiscal positions over the over many years um, is considerable. Uh, but there are social forces in France, of course, that uh, that reinforce that. Um, uh, Italy, on the other hand, is looking actually rather more promising. And Italy, of course, has been delivering a budget, a primary budget surplus. Right? So. They have rather more standing, in a sense, in trying to speak about bringing some more sense into the, into the fiscal affairs of, of, of the Union, of the Eurozone. That's really important. However, you've got, you've got a country like Finland, where austerity, and they make no thought about it, the Finns have been practicing austerity, and they're in a serious recession. And they're proposing to increase 
the degree of fiscal contraction. Right? This is completely mad. The economics we've we, we've seen, and the trouble is that you know, the received narrative uh, among some finance ministers, anyway, and um, and some parts of the European Commission, is that this is the right policy. Okay, if you if you're running a budget deficit, you've got to you know, uh, you've got to cut expenditures and raise taxes. Um, uh, never mind that that actually may increase the budget. And, and, and it does seem to be uh, a, a, this monomaniacal focus on uh, government finances at the expense of looking at other variables such Absolutely. as their external and trade and, and, and private debt. Which, and of course, it was private debt which was largely responsible for the economic crisis of 2008, not public property. Certainly not. I mean, Ireland had a public debt of about 30 percent and falling. Uh, Spain had a public debt of about 40 percent and not rising. Uh, these were countries in very good fiscal shape. Uh, but um, the, the focus on the fiscal, uh, you know, they used to say about the IMF, it's mostly fiscal. That's, the, that's IMF, right? That's what. Now, we thought we got round, got over that. And yet, the fund, I think it now realizes mistakenly, uh, got brought into when, when the Troika was set up and and the collaboration among the fund and the ECB and the European Commission uh, went forward. The fund got drawn into a program for Greece and then subsequently for others that um, focused on the fiscal. Yes, there were all these reforms that had to be done. Yes, 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 yes but uh, really, that, that was mission got, creep for the IMF. You got you got to get that the fiscal position under control. Uh, and of course, they underestimated the fiscal multipliers, which they have now conceded. Uh, and therefore the contractionary effect of those fiscal measures. Uh, and, the, and the targets kept on getting missed and missed and missed. And so there was more and more focus on the fiscal and less on the things that really mattered. And that's the problem with Greece and, with, and in some other cases too, that um, the focus on the fiscal leads your, uh, your gaze away from things that are more important, like liberalizing product markets and services markets in particular. The competitiveness problem, so-called. I mean, these countries, are they lost competitiveness. Well, what happened was not so much, in my view, attributable to a diverging set of labor costs, but rather because the uh, capital inflows into these countries came into the what we call the non-tradable sectors, okay? And that pushed up the prices and rewards and returns in those sectors, drew resources into those sectors and away from the tradable sector. And that's where your loss of competitiveness came, for. How do you, came from. How do you deal with that? You liberalize the non-traded sector. You liberalize all those services, right? Of course, there are big vested interests against that. I was just, uh, I was just with a notaire here in Paris. So it's a, you know, the notaires, the lawyers, right, uh, uh, actually got on the street demonstrating against a part of a reform law that would make their sector more competitive. Right? These were lawyers getting out and you know, demonstrating in the streets against them. Right? And he had uh, a poster in his office. This is a wonderful man. I think he's terrific. He's a great lawyer, too. Uh, but um, uh, he had a poster in his office uh, protesting against the attack on the notaires and the basic institutions of French justice. No, sorry, excuse me. It was an attempt to liberalize that market, liberalize the pharmaceuticals market, or the pharmacies rather, and so on. All these protected bits of the economy, which actually do stifle growth. It's, it's, it's ironic, and this is the paradox, because of course the, the argument is that you can never get these vested interests to, uh, to give up uh, their, uh, their perks unless you have um, um, uh, conditions of uh, austerity pertaining. And yet, um, yeah. if, if you, it, it's much harder to implement than if you're just talking about something that will exacerbate the... It issue. is. And, and, you know, let's face it. In some cases, the best way to deal with the vested interests is to buy them out one way or another. If you think that taxis, uh, taxi services are, are too restricted and so forth, just... And, but the medallion holders 
um, are violently resistant to any kind of reform, well, um, just buy them up, buy up their medallions, right? And then replace them all with Uber? And replace them, <laughs> sure, yeah. you know, whatever, okay? Um, uh, but that's, and, and, and there are other, you know, other dimensions in which you could... That would actually be quite reflationary. That would that, actually reverse yeah, and the dynamic. It would be, it would be reflationary and and, and, and... and deal with the services uh, uh, inflation problem would, you've discussed. But, but, you know, as I say, the vested interests are... are uh, we're understandably reluctant to buy them out because somehow it seems terrible to make transfers to people who... We own buy out bankers in protect. one sense. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> you know, it'd be cheaper than bailing out the bankers, that's yeah. for sure. In fact, uh, a lot of people <laughs> say that we could have solved this whole European problem if we had just cut a $200 billion check to the Greeks uh, six or seven years ago. That might have ended the problem. Oh, well, no, I, I mean, okay. <laughs> of no, course, I, the, the politics of that it would have been virtually impossible. Yeah, the the thing is, though, uh, okay, yes and no. I, I certainly, I was advocating in the spring of 2010 that Greece should have a major debt restructuring, debt forgiveness. Mm -hmm. okay. But that said, uh, Greece has huge institutional, social, uh, political problems. This is, and it's, it's just been that way for a very long time. And, and the, maybe that, that has to be, end up being a, a ward of, this, the, of, the, of the EU for I, over time. Well, I mean, it's, it it's does, an uncomfortable way to look it. At doesn't it doesn't seem to have done the job. That's yeah. the trouble, having this troika in there. You know, it has to come from the Greeks themselves, really. Uh, and um, the reform of tax administration and so forth. I mean, you actually have to have a, uh, uh, a, a polity that um, wants tax reform in such a way that everybody pays their fair share. That requires a certain degree of co social cohesion. And in Greece, that social cohesion, at least since the Civil War, just after the Second World War, at least since then, that social cohesion has been very difficult to achieve. And so that's why you saw, uh, first you had the dictatorship with the colonels, um, then uh, you had uh, the, effectively the alternation in power of a center-right and center-left uh, pair of parties. Each time one of the parties came in, they put all their friends in government jobs, but you couldn't sack the other people from the, the other so you party. You had this inexorable expansion of the right? civil society. Uh, because you couldn't sack anybody, mm -hmm. and therefore you had this inexorable expansion of the civil service. And now, when you say, hey, when you want to cut back the civil service, oh, gee, 8,000, 10,000, 15,000, there are hundreds of thousands. At a time when, a, when you already have 20% plus unemployment. So well, that's a, okay, that's an issue. You've got to find productive employment for yep. those people. That's right. But, um, uh, but there's no, it's, it's demoralizing to the social fabric to know that there are many, many people in these government jobs who literally do not do anything and who retire early at the boot. Uh, this is not, so this is one. Uh, area, which is very important, uh, but, um, but there are all sorts of structural issues in Greece that do require, as I say, a, a degree of social cohesion and, and, and trust that um, is hard to establish. I mean, in that respect, the advent of Syriza was, I think, a very positive thing. Because, because it's part of that, it's not uh, yeah. part of that corrupt old uh, political state. That's right. And That's of course, right. uh, they, they, although, they, although, hard left wing of Syriza is part of an older political structure, shall we say, <laughs> uh, which, um, uh, which is not blameless in, this ma in these matters. No, although the concern might, uh, must be surely that um, if uh, this government falls, that you might get something much worse next time. You might, yes. I mean, the, the puzzle to many of us, of course, uh, has been why Syriza, when it came in, didn't form a coalition with the center party rather than, rather than with the... Uh, right-wing nationalist party that it, that it is in coalition with. And I've never, from any, from any part of the Greek political spectrum, I've never heard a really satisfactory explanation of that. But anyway, I, who knows what would happen? And who knows what's going to happen in the UK uh, in May? Somebody said, well, what's your government going to be like? Uh, I said, are we going to have a government? <laughs> Certainly it looks like it will be a coalition again. Uh, uh, in the UK? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, but it might be a coalition that would have to 
have to call new elections fairly soon thereafter. I mean, it's... Um, it's Back to a, the 1970s all over It's again. a very tricky, difficult situation. No, it's worse than the 1970s. In terms of potential instability, it's worse than the 1970s because of the uh, vociferous tendencies, the, 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 the fractionalization of the political world. And, and, uh, um, and then we've got uh, elections coming up in Spain and you have a new variable there with Podemos. So, um, well, it's Podemos Ciudadanos, which actually is a very interesting phenomenon and has been rising while Podemos somewhat falls. And Ciudadanos is... Uh, has a, what seems from the outside, a reasonably sensible economic program. Um, Podemos, it's not clear that Podemos has any economic program as yet that we might be able to analyze. Uh, but um, uh, they are, they seem to be gaining a lot of credibility. And it's surprising for a Catalan based party uh, that they are getting support from uh, a, a wide range elsewhere in Spain. So the next few months uh, could be very, very interesting in the Chinese sense of the word. Absolutely. And since I'm going to Beijing on, on Saturday, um, I, uh, I, what's happening in China is equally interesting uh, and uh, not easy to fathom at any time. It never has been. But uh, well, maybe, on, maybe on the way back, you can go back to Greece and consult the Oracle of uh, Delphi. <laughs> I'm fairly positive. On, I, actually, I'm fairly positive on China. I am. I mean, you, you referred to it uh, a little while ago. The prospects for a bad end to the Greek story are somewhat greater, I fear, than they were even a few weeks ago. But um, uh, uh, good politicians, anyway, are skilled at uh, rescuing things that are on the brink, and we have to hope that, uh, that the politicians will be good. I, 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 I am very concerned that, uh, that there's not yet a serious meeting of the minds. I agree with you. But on that somewhat hopeful note, uh, that uh, maybe uh, uh, more sensible minds uh, prevail, uh, we'll um, end the interview. Uh, Richard, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Thank you, Marshall. Yeah.